Good evening. Welcome to the Archdale Church of Christ in Charlotte, North Carolina. I'm your teacher, Russ McCullough, and welcome to our Wednesday evening class. We are taking a, a short break from our series in Hebrews, a deep dive in Hebrews, and discussing a movie we saw Thursday before last called The Ark and the Darkness. And when it comes to the worldwide flood of Noah, everyone has far more questions than we have answers. This is not a problem. Uh, and I want to illustrate it as to why it shouldn't be a problem. Uh, because how many uh, around the table here believe Caesar invaded Gaul and wrote a book about it? Yeah. He wrote the the Gallic Wars. The Gallic Wars. And Gallic Wars. everybody except Caesar has authoritative regarding the Gallic Wars. Well, that's really interesting because no one else wrote a history of the Gallic Wars except Caesar. And Caesar wrote the Gallic Wars not so much as a history, but as a, a spin political book to enhance his standing back in Rome. And by the time he got back, he was this like hero and he wrote this book and everybody accepts it. Well, it's kind of interesting because um, there's only like five copies that they found of this book and the the one that is closest to the time it was authored is like 500 years so we have a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy and yet no one doubts what they've read in these copies Caesar wrote it. yes so if you look at the gallic wars you're going to find you're going to have a lot more questions than you have answers. But that doesn't seem to be an issue with anybody. Now, when it comes to the Bible and creation and the worldwide flood of Noah, everybody wants to doubt. Well, I wouldn't say everybody, but many people want to doubt the authenticity of the scripture regarding these matters because they personally have more questions about it than they have answers. We had the same people would never doubt Caesar, but they'll doubt Moses. Anyway, uh, the scriptures tell us what we need to know and what we don't need to know, we don't need to know. He's left out. This is what's called faith. By faith, Noah. He didn't leave us a detailed manual of what he did, when he did, and how he did it. He didn't write a journal or a diary. Year 102, day 321. I went and... In all fairness, Genesis 7 is basically... Genesis 7 and 8 is basically written like a ship's log. Yes, it is. But it's very general. It's... It's and specific. a fair amount of time passes between entries now that you actually. Yeah. So we want to take things um, with the same standard across the board. So all we're saying is give Moses the same amount of credibility that you give Caesar. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, in. Again, we want to thank Carl for putting together the movie. That was a, a great experience. We enjoyed it very much. Glad to hear it. Once and, again. and so in the movie, they many times referred to uh, two passages, uh, one out of Matthew 24 and the other out of 2 Peter 3. I only remember them bringing up Matthew 24 once. Well, they alluded to it a, a lot. Um, and it's funny because the one time they quoted it, I'm like, well, I'm just groaning in my head thinking they mistranslated it as usual. Well, 
speaking of um, of that, I just uh, wanted to share with everybody. Um, this is the modern little version that I refer to often. It's uh, a 30-year-old open source ongoing translation. And the way it works is that any um, Greek scholar can uh, write their opinion about any word or a group of words and how they're used in, in, um, in the Bible. And if they're correct, then it gets inserted into the open. That's the, that's the, the idea of open source translation is continuously being updated. A normal translation will have revisions every number of years, some, some not at all, others maybe 10 uh, years apart or, or 20, whatever it might be. This is ongoing. And it's it's the people that that uh, own it and operate it are members of the, of the Church of Christ, and I find it to be an excellent excellent source of understanding uh, original words without going to the original language. In other words, piggybacking on people who know a lot more than than I do. The other thing I wanted to share with you is what I recently obtained. This is uh, a Bible without chapters and verses. Mm -hmm. So it forces you as a Bible student to do your own outlines, mm -hmm. find your own context, yep. and understand the natural breaks in Scripture as opposed to just looking at the numbers that we have in our um, all of our translations, which were rendered about 500 years ago. So this is kind of reminds me of what I kind of reminds me of what I'm currently in the process of doing of doing with with a lot of passages. And recently, I've been doing it with most of the book with with the entire book of Joel. Basically, I. Basically, I go to the Masoretic text and pay attention to which verses have a samek or a pe at the end. Mm -hmm. That basically marks off the end of a train of thought, which makes which means that between one and the next one, every all the verses in between are a sing are one continuous train of thought. So that makes it easier to. So that makes it easier to limit the context and figure out which ones which ones transition into which others and which ones mm -hmm. don't. So that's definitely so it is definitely helpful. That basically mm -hmm. seems like it's doing the same thing with the Greek text. Mm -hmm. Now, um, one thing I would recommend highly, um, in fact, tomorrow, uh, every Thursday, David Price on his podcast. Uh, picks a um, a passage in the Bible that uh, people have historically taken out of context and misapplied. And uh, his his podcast is on uh, his Facebook page, David Price. Uh, it's seven in the morning, but you can go there anytime. It's it's posted there continuously. But really, really. Uh, good discussions whenever he does that every Thursday. So we recommend that Holly. And so tonight we're going to quit, take a quick look at uh, Matthew 24, but spend more time in second Peter three. So Lois, if, uh, if you go to Matthew 24, mm -hmm. could you uh, kindly read for us? First of all, um, verses one through three. Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them, you see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. In, in verse 3. Oh, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? 
and what will be the sign of your coming and of the close of the age. Okay. This uh, sets up the, the whole uh, discourse in Matthew 24. The temple rested on Mount Zion uh, next to the, the Kidron Valley, and on the other side of the valley was the Mount of Olives. So you could sit on the Mount of Olives and see clearly Jerusalem, and especially the temple, because the temple was uh, covered with uh, precious metals and alabaster and um, some sources say it was so bright as the sun rose you couldn't look at it directly it was that brilliant and so uh, the apostles are pointing out the grandeur of herod's temple and uh, truly it must have been the most magnificent structure on earth at the time um, and so uh, jesus says hey yeah it's <laughs> It's beautiful, but I can tell you, uh, not one stone is going to be left upon another, which was an incredulous thing to say because those stones were so large and so massive. You would think, well, it would take an army of of men a long time to over the, throw that thing stone by stone. But that's exactly what happened. Uh, In fact, the reason they took it apart stone by stone was because as the fire was because as the as the fire was melting the gold on the on the inside walls it basically it would melt and seep into the cracks yes so they would dis so they disassembled every last stone just to make sure they got all of the gold that seeped th into that seeped in between them yes uh and they carted it and took it back to rome and literally within 40 years this is exactly what happened. There was not a single stone. A little more than 40, yeah. Left upon another. You can go today and look down into the valley and see the stones that were overthrown. Uh, what we see today is the the Temple Mount, but what, what you see today is just basically the retaining wall of the area on which the temple once sat. Uh, and so not to mention the Dome of the Rock is there now. Yes. Now, uh, as a result of Jesus's incredulous statement, the apostles ask him three questions. Uh, number one, uh, tell us when these things are going to be. Mm -hmm. And since judgment is coming to the temple, Tell us when these things will happen. When, when is the judgment of the Lord going to come on this place? And number three, when, when's the end of the world going to happen? So three questions. Wait, are, what, you, meant, you skipped the second one. No. What will be the sign of your parousia? Sign of your coming? Yeah. That's, the Greek word is parousia. And if you hmm. check the, the theological dictionary of the New hmm. Testament, it refers to a visit from a ruler yeah. in power, complete with pomp, what, complete with, with pomp, celebration, and addressing of requests and or grievances. Um, this is the first biblical occurring. Chronologically speaking, this is the first divinely inspired instance of the term because this speak because this question by the disciples comes before all subsequent uses in the New Testament mm -hmm. were written mm -hmm. or spoken. Well, Christ, uh, through so Peter, old, yeah. spoke of, um, on the day of Pentecost, uh, of Joel's prophecy of uh, the great and terrible day. It was a day of salvation for those who were obedient. It was a day of judgment. Um Exactly. For for those who refused, and you it's recall when Jesus was uh, uh, oh, on that. on the way to the cross, and the women were weeping. Mm -hmm. And what does he say to them? Don't weep for uh, for me. Weep for yourselves and your children, because within that generation, judgment is coming, and destruction is coming, and it's going to be like nothing. Uh, ever before or since. 
Did he say that? Did he say that last part to those women? I'd have to look up the passage. Yeah, I'm trying to remember what passage that is. Yep. I have to make a. Yeah, which note. passage was that? Because yeah, I find it significant. I find it significant that that exact phrase occurs in Matthew 24 and Mark 13, but not in Luke 21. Yeah. It's also significant that Luke 21 says talks of, had, ends the speech by talking about Jesus going to the Mount of Olives, mm -hmm. implying it was a different speech. So it is significant that he meant said that detail in one of them, but not the other. Well, all the synoptics have different information about the same event, so you have to kind of put them all together. Yeah, yeah, but that detail, yeah, but that detail of Matthew and Mark, they went to the Mount of Olives at the start of the count. Luke, they Luke, they go there at the end of the account. They're obviously being given in two different places. Can't be the same speech. Well, <clears throat> the same can be said of the the Sermon on the Mount. It, it apparently was given at least twice. Well, of course, Jesus said the same thing on multiple. Yeah. Jesus, of course, that's how rabbinical teaching worked back then. Yeah, repetition. If if, if it's important, you're going to repeat it just to drive the point home to your students. The uh, the point we want to make here yeah. uh, in Matthew 24 uh, is uh, the, the last part of the passage, uh, verses 36 uh, to 44. Um, could you read that, Tony? <clears throat> but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only, as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Yep. Therefore, you must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Okay. Now, our, our question, uh, is this section speaking of the destruction of Jerusalem, or is this section speaking of the end of the world? My answer is actually neither. Okay. Well, it's about... It's about the it's about the it's about Jesus's second coming, mm -hmm. after which time will still be going. Okay, well, um, we'll table that until table we get the second that. second Peter. Um, but the point is, uh, the destruction of Jerusalem is time certain. And there will be detailed signs. Mm -hmm. And, and all, in fact, there already had been details. Jesus gave the sign of Jonah. Yes. Yes. Jonah actually what did Jonah say? What did Jonah act? What did Jonah actually preach to Nineveh? Forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Mm -hmm. Jesus was giving Jerusalem a day for a year. Mm -hmm. Forty years mm -hmm. from when Jesus made that announcement, Jerusalem will be destroyed. It's very interesting use. Uh, 40 is used in a number of ways <clears throat> that are all uh, numerically significant. Uh, but <clears throat> this speaks of a judgment that's coming that no one uh, will be able to see coming. It's just going to be like the, the days um, of Noah. Not quite. Okay. Not quite. The details, actually, 
when you look when you look at what they said to the to the, what they said if the owner of the house had known in what hour the thief had come he would have watched yeah the but... implication is that those who do those who understand what god has said about it will see it coming but everyone else will just be living normally as if nothing's if there's nothing to worry about and because they are ready right what do you mean i i didn't hear the first part of the sentence. verse 44 because they are ready they're ready for him to come yeah. we should we should be ready every day of our life it, Indeed. And the funny thing is, in Matthew 24, 44, the Greek actually says, therefore, become ready, mm -hmm. not be ready 24 seven, rather prepare yourself to be ready when that time comes. The 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 point Jesus is making. When it comes to the destruction of Jerusalem, they're going to be very, very clear signs and you need to be ready. Right. Uh, when clear you see, signs, no matter what, clear signs on, on both occasions. Yeah, when 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 uh, when the uh, there's a break be, between the assaults of the the wise, uh, the, the, the desolation. Yes, everyone else will be caught. Everyone else will be caught off guard because right. they're not paying attention. And historically, and, the, and in the and in the destruction of Jerusalem, it was. It was the Jews who didn't flee to the mountains who were in the latter category. Yes, the the unbelievers stayed and the believers left. The, the believers fled as soon as they saw the armies approaching, yes. just like Jesus warned them to yeah. in Luke 21, 20, and 21. And historically, we know what happened that uh, Tiberius, I think it's Tiberius. Titus. Titus. Or... Who was who was are you, the ask, are you asking who was emperor? Or who no, was who was the, the who was the commander in the field? The commander would have been Titus. Titus. Vespasian was the emperor. Vespasian. Okay. All right. So Ves, uh, Vespasian actually started the assault, and then Nero committed suicide. There was no emperor in Rome, and Vespasian was called back to Rome. He was uh, initiated eventually. Uh, yeah, as after, emperor, yeah, after the year of the, and his yeah, son Titus the three, then the took command of the army when things settled down in Rome and, and reassaulted. And in between Vespasian's assault and Titus's assault, uh, there was a temporary lull in the siege, and the armies pulled back, and people could come and go in Jerusalem again. And that's when the Christians fled. Uh, that long yes, in, in between those two assaults of Vespasian and Titus, because uh, Titus uh, he he uh, was the victor in the field, and the arch of arch of Titus is still uh, in Rome. You can go see it today, and uh, emblazoned on the archer is all these engravings of um, uh, loot they took out of the temple. Uh, it was uh, it was it was it was considered a great victory. Uh, but then Jesus spends the last time of his dialogue that instead of a, time, a judgment time when you know what's going to happen, when it's going to happen and how it's going to happen. And you have to pay attention to the signs. Uh, there's going to be another judgment that's coming, a final judgment. There'll be the only sign there'll be was be, be no sign. Uh, it'll be as in the days of Noah, when uh, people were marrying and giving in marriage uh, up to the day that the, the door was shut and it started raining. And well, then it was too late. And, and so the day before the door shut, everything was as it always was. And then when the door shut, everything changed. And that's what Jesus says. You're not going to know when it's going to happen. So you just need to be ready. And not worry about when it's going to happen. And this this is the uh, uh, the message. It seems uh, consistent in Scripture when it comes to uh, the second coming of Christ. Don't worry about when. Worry about are you ready at the, the moment? In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, when you hear the shout and the trumpet, and things 
hit the brakes. Will you be ready? Because once you hear it, once you see it, the gig sealed. is up. Yeah, your fate is sealed. Um, and so, um, correctly in the movie, it seems, uh, they have a, a very good uh, analogy here. Uh, the uh, when, when Christ returns, at the end of time, it's going to come suddenly, without warning, and it'll be just like in the days of Noah when uh, everybody was oblivious until it happened, and then it was too late. Everyone accepted Noah. Yes, yes, and he uh, was proclaiming uh, the gospel of the time. You know, repent and be saved. Yep, he was. They just laughed at him. Apparently, no one. He made no converts whatsoever. Uh, but yet, he and his family were saved uh, by water. Peter tells us, as there's a direct correlation between the water that saved Noah in the ark, separating him from the sin of the world, and our baptism into Christ, which now saves us in like manner. The water uh, separates us. From our sin, our sins are separated from us in the water, as Paul says in Colossians uh, two, uh, ten to thirteen, that the powerful working of God is done in the waters of baptism, uh, as He uses the circumcision of Christ to remove our sins uh, in baptism. Uh, so it's a very, very striking uh, similarity there. So. Oh. And actually, when I'm looking back at when I'm looking back at Genesis seven, I find another detail that actually ties in nicely with this with that thing with that quotation of Matthew twenty four thirty six that made me groan. Okay. Genesis seven four. Yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights. God gave Noah advanced warning. Yeah. He told him when it would be seven days before it, it actually happened. That ties in well with the fact with what happens when you check the Greek text of all of the no one knows or you do not know passages. In all six of those passages, there's two there's two key di there's two key differences between how they read and what how they're translated. One, the verb isn't gnosko, meaning to know, but ido, meaning to see or perceive. Second, most English translations render it as if it's present tense, which implies a timeless state principle. But the verbs, but in all six instances, it's actually perfect tense. It should be rendered no one has perceived or you have not perceived the implication is that this statement is sweep sweepingly applies to everyone in history other than the father up until jesus said it there no such sweeping statement is made for people after the olivet discourse was given yeah. And that ties in well with 1 Timothy 6, 13 through 16. Um, let me actually get that quick. While you're looking for that, uh, it is biblically unimportant as to when the in Lord the mean, returns. Yeah, in the inter for the interim, it's pretty much trivial. Uh, when it happens... It's going to be too late, and everybody will know it. In the meantime, what do Christians know? They know the Lord is coming. And they know they must be ready. But the hour and the day is Got of it. no consequence. It would only matter if you're not ready. Exactly. If, exactly. if you're ready. Uh, if you're ready, then. It doesn't matter. Got it. I, I got it. I charge thee before God, who is making all things alive, and of Christ Jesus, who did testify before Pontius Pilate in the right profession, 
that thou keep the command unspotted, unblameable, till the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his own times he shall show the blessed and only potentate, the king of the kings and lord of the lords, who only is having immortality, dwelling in light unapproachable, whom no one of men did see nor is able to see, to whom is honor and might age enduring. Amen. So he's it's like, inter what's interesting is, well, first off, the man, the manifestation can't refer to Jesus's actual return because the verb for show is dikneo, and everywhere else that word is used in the New Testament, it refers to something being privately presented or disclosed to a select person or group of people. Every when Jesus returns, every eye will see it, right? So this can't be referring to the return itself, so more likely it's referring to the date of his return. Which no uh, one further, no furthermore, in his own furthermore, times is plural, implying that God would disclose it over a range of time, not at an instant of time. Well. And there have been a number of judgments since AD 70. Um, yes, but we do not necessarily know. Uh, but we can see the fruits of judgment, we can see uh, the fall of Rome, which was predicted in Revelation, the yep. things that would shortly come. I am past. no widow, and that I am no widow yeah. that predicts that the, that predicts that the church. That predicts that the Roman Church would still be going after impure after political Rome falls. That is true. We also see uh, catastrophic um, judgments, if you if you please. Uh, we see uh, the Thirty Years' War that came about between the forces of. Uh, Rome and the forces of the Reformation. Uh, it brought uh, catastrophic uh, horror upon the, the world as it then was. Um, we see uh, great tribulation uh, in the times in of many places around Na Napoleon. Uh, people thought that uh, that the end of the world was imminent because of what had transpired in the 15 years of the napoleonic wars they the american the yes. american civil war people in america thought well this is the this end is, of their this civilization is, yes. not, not civilization as a whole yes but people uh the, the, the civilizations are judged but not the whole world but not the whole world but the, jesus speaking here in matthew 24 is is the last and final judgment yep. that everybody will participate in yep. and no one will see coming because the day and the hour is is unknown there's no it way has to not know. been foreseen it's, that's my that see that's my point that's a distinction without a difference is it not not as far as the greek implications are concerned there is no way to know the day and the hour for anyone Christian or non-Christian? Actually, there is, and I actually go over it, and I actually go over it in my book. Right. If you're willing to take, a, if you're willing to take a look at it later, at some point. Well, at point, at some point later, but some point, absolutely. Um, Let's move on. Uh, the day. In, uh, um, I'm just saying you need to you need to your understanding needs to be able to make sense of what Paul said in First Timothy six thirteen through okay. sixteen. Um, Why is manifestation singular, yet times is plural, and show refers to a private disclosure or presentation? That would entail the ability to know uh, a private manifestation, which the scripture does not speak to. What do you mean? Jesus. By private, I mean disclosed. To... Well, think about this. In first. First Timothy, why did Paul write First Timothy? 
to give Timothy instructions for teaching pastor, for teaching elders and ministers. The implication is that as the time draws close, God will reveal the time to wise elders and ministers so they can prepare their congregations. I don't believe that at all. Um, Paul also wrote. Well, how else do you explain this passage? This passage is pretty much. um, Well, this passage here in Matthew 24, verse 44. because the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. And he's speaking uh, to his apostles. Do not expect. It, do not expect is do not know at the time. It, do not know. At, but again, that ignores the fact that he, that ignores the fact that in verses 36 and 42, he used the non-sweeping statement, have not perceived, applying only to the past and present at that moment doesn't rule out the future. He all, Jesus also mentioned it, Jesus also mentioned in Acts 1 7 it is not from you to know the times or seasons the Father has said in his own authority. You is in the genitive case, not the dative case. Most English translations render it for you. It should be from you. The top but the times and seasons the Father has set in his own authority, is not to be learned from the apostles. I totally agree with that. The times and the seasons are not disclosed to anyone at any time. Now then what did or... Paul mean? Then what did Paul mean in 1 Timothy 6, 14 and 15? He does not contradict the rest of scripture. He exactly, doesn't correct what Paul that says. What he says needs to cohere with the rest of scripture. Including All scripture, Matthew 24. Matthew 24, what Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, what Peter wrote in his epistle, all, and then what we read in, in Revelation, all they do correlate. Agree. And no I one, no, problem with that. I'm no saying one, this passage from 1 Timothy needs to agree with it, needs to agree yeah. with that as well, and vice versa. Okay. Scripture never contradicts itself on any point. You're absolutely right there, but there is no scripture that would indicate in any way, shape, matter, or form that at some time in the future, God is going to reveal to any human the date and the time of his coming. I just gave you one. First Timothy 6, 14, 15. Okay, name the date then. The date? You want it? Yeah. October 1st, 2036. Wow. That's not possible. Yes, it is. It's, it's, it's not, Carl. 6,000 years after, after Adam's first sin. That's assuming... Tishri 10, Tishri 10 in the 2007th year after Jesus gave the announcement at the Feast of Tabernacles in John 7, 32 through 36. I... I I've done I've done the math. I I give the scriptural references going yeah. ruling out alternative possibilities. Well, let me ask you something that might be just really ridiculously simple in this conversation. But does it matter in the long run as a Christian to worry about I'm not worried wait a minute, wait a minute. To worry about and talk about the fact that we do not know when Christ will come the end of time. As a Christian, we need to live our lives daily to be ready to meet Christ because we do not know how long we will last. And we I'm aware we, of that we, and I agree with that. Okay. We I'm can, not guaranteeing I live until that time either. Okay, then to me it's not a matter of ha- of getting a lot of controversy over. I agree, which is why I was which is why I was surprised that we're we're really having this conversation. I mean, granted, it's good to be able to talk these things mm-hmm. out and actually bounce ideas off each other. I'm actually mm-hmm. I was actually going into this in the hopes of learning more mm-hmm. about where you're coming from, yeah. and I was hoping you would do the same with me. Yeah. Well, we are uh, doing that, but the reason we're 
conversing with this is because the movie brought these the passages yeah. these passages up. This is of a course. So we want to look at the passages and and what they what they mean. Yep. And uh, uh, I believe that the Bible is totally one hundred percent unspecific as to dates and times. And uh, you uh, and I disagree with you that. You disagree with it's that. a difference of opinion and. Time will tell which of us actually, and time will tell which of us actually has it right. May not find out in our lifetimes, but who knows? It could be some other uh, some other possibility entirely. Yes. Could, we could both be wrong. the The point is to at least mm -hmm. is to interpret the text as faithfully and mm -hmm. accurately as possible. And can we at least agree on that? Well, absolutely. And the text emphasizes readiness and not the calendar exactly because for the most because let's face it nobody jesus was speaking to at the time was going to live to see it the, yeah actually john saw it he saw the oh in a vision right no he saw the destruction he he lived through the i'm talking about jesus second coming okay all right yeah jesus yeah that still hasn't happened exactly and no one knows when it will. Right. Uh, Maybe but uh, going to Second Peter three uh, one to thirteen. Um, but the, just to, just to say we 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 can disagree without being disagreeable. Mm -hmm. That's uh, what, that was my hope. Yeah, and so uh, we want to always Actually, have in, indeed i disagree with the people who made this movie on certain points yeah. depending on the person in question yeah. um yeah i i do too i i was uh, <clears throat> disappointed with some of the responses some of those those guys had of course and uh i mean my 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 points were more nitpicky like when yeah. they bring up the ark settling, the ark settling on the mountains in the set on the seventeenth day of the seventh month, mm -hmm. and they're showing. But in the background, they're showing them leaving the ark, which didn't yeah. happen until right. seven right. months late, over seven yeah, months later. Was, yeah. I'm like, yeah, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm like, dude, that gives the wrong impression. Mm -hmm. I, I knew the text. I knew what the text was referring yeah. to, so I knew better. Yeah. I caught that. But. Yeah, they because. Because uh, Noah had to send out the dove. Yep. And the dove kept coming back. And so no place to land. Then finally she brings back a twig. Mm -hmm. And then finally they can get out. But uh, the... the you, know, it's in, you know, there's something actually in that book I brought that actually mentions something about the, about the olive and the dove. Hmm. I, actually quote, I actually quoted it here, but I think I'll save that as a little bonus at the end. Yeah. Because it actually is really interesting. It is a fast, does make for a fascinating analogy the way I use it. You were saying? Uh, I was going to say that uh, uh, I found it very instructive to listen to the uh, 19 minute interview after the credits. I listened to that. Oh, online. you stuck around for that? No, I listened to it online. Oh, it's available online. Good yeah, to know. yeah I, I saw it somewhere, but. They go off the rails theologically uh, and draw conclusions, um, but they're uh, coming from a Liberty University evangelical premillennial mindset. And it just strikes me as odd that they would mention these two passages um, that don't leave time uh, for any kind of tribulation because everything's one way one second and then everything's different the next in both of these passages and there's no room for like the antichrist and for a tribulation all these things that that they want to interject well that well the the hebrew text of daniel 9 25 through 27 indicates that the 70th week comes after the second destruction of jerusalem but that could take a slightly but that could take a slight amount of time, but I really don't want to derail this again. But yeah, I, but yeah, let's just say that verse 27 opens with a walk consecutive perfect tense verb, 
and the last imperfect verb before it, meaning this occurs after that action, was shall destroy the temple and the sanctuary, the, sa the city and the sanctuary. Hence, everything in verse 27 occurs after that. We've run out of time, so we're not going to be looking at 2 Peter 3 Darn it. Uh, until uh, next week. Uh, Darn it. That was the, po that was the part right. I had a feeling I would agree with you guys the most on. <laughs> uh, well, in, anyway, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that uh, next week. So, uh, so uh, thanks, everybody. Um, quickly, can I, can I bring up that little bonus thing about the olive? Sure. So in when I actually bring this up when I'm discussing the analogy that Paul the the analogy Paul brings up in Romans 11 16 through 24 regarding the olive regarding belief, believers being regarding wild and native branches of an olive tree I'm like it's significant that Paul specifically likened the full body of believers to an olive tree John Woodmerab wrote a discussion on olive trees that gives new shades of meaning to Paul's analogy. And I quote, there is no doubt that olives are hardy. They can survive diseases and drought and tolerate higher salinities and lower temperatures than can most other evergreen orchard species. They are also tolerant of boron in the soil as well as wide ranges in soil pH. Olive trees can not only grow where there is little soil and water and in stony ground, but also under precipices. This fact must have facilitated their establishment on the initially barren post-Diluvian mountains. Olive trees are also hardy in a genetic sense. Wild and domesticated varieties cross easily. The repeated siring of olive trees by vegetative propagation does not diminish their viability in the slightest. The olive can regenerate not only from branch tips and from ovuli, but also from virtually any tree fragment. This means that just about any piece of olive tree debris left stranded after the flood could have given rise to an olive seedling given the right local conditions. Thus, olive trees can regenerate from side shoots only five to 10 centimeters long, branch fragments only 23 centimeters long and 1.9 centimeters in diameter, Thick firewood-like truncheons, bases of trunks with the roots and trunk length severed off. Olive trees can even re regenerate from bark fragments, as well as large roots. Furthermore, the orientation of the olive tree debris left in the ground is of little importance. Olive trees can be regenerated from branches driven as stakes in the ground, as well as branches laid horizontally or at any diagonal in between. Whitcomb Fig trees are the same way. What? Fig trees can be the same, same way. Whitcomb and Morris have noted that enough time elapsed from the emergence of the mountain peaks as a result of flood water retreat and the bird bringing the olive leaf, not olive branch, for the olive's vegetative propagules to have rooted and sent out shoots. Indeed, seven to eight weeks are sufficient for rooting, with durations of time as short as 30 days being sufficient under other conditions. Some of the conditions peculiar to the flood must have facilitated the vegetative propagation of olive trees. For instance, olive cultivars root better under low light, and putrescine promotes earlier rooting of olive propagules. The semi-darkness could have occurred when some of the olive tree fragments had been covered by decaying flotsam. The putrescine, an amine breakdown product of decomposition, must have come from the decaying material. Noah's Ark, a feasibility study, pages 161 and 162, inline citations omitted. Very interesting. It uh, definitely gives whole new meaning. Yeah. They're hardy, survive stress and drought, disease and drought, tolerant of wide, of wide ranges of conditions, hardy in a genetic sense. They can regenerate from just about any tree mm. fragment. The orientation in the ground is of little importance. They root better under low light and are promoted by and are promoted by putrescine. Very, very these the parallels between this and the Christian life are unbelievably are unbelievably strong, if you ask me. Well, it's apparent that 
olive had the most resilience after the flood of any plant. It was the first one to grow back, grow out new, yep. new growth. Um, but anyway, uh, as we uh, uh, close here, we always enjoin everyone to be noble like the Bereans and search the scriptures daily to see whether or not these things are so. Uh, search the scriptures uh, regarding these matters, Matthew 24, 2 Peter uh, 3, and uh, mm -hmm. Paul's uh, statements to the Thessalonians, the book of Revelation. A lot of things, but be ready. No matter when it is, be ready. Be ready. Your own time can come soon. Yes, okay. yes. Uh, the scriptures say that uh, first comes death and then the judgment. It's far more likely that we'll die Fast physically right. than to see mm -hmm. the second coming. And so don't hedge your bets. Absolutely. And wait to the sign before you become a Christian because you will lose. Okay. Um, Rest for disaster. Yes. So uh, God bless you. And now uh, is the day of salvation. Now, today is the day of salvation. Amen. So thanks again for joining us here. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow morning, Lord willing, on uh, Carolina Morning Meditations. Mm-hmm.